So, it's my turn to tell you about something new in JavaScript land, or and the web land, actually. And um, but, sorry, I have a proposal. Had, had we started, by the way? I thought so. Oh, sorry. I, hadn't, <laughs> I didn't realize that, but you were still just like, oh, might just start soon. <laughs> So, so we're we're trying this once more. Another episode. <laughs> I love the, of... the sigh there. Like, oh, here we are again. I'm having to <sighs> talk to Jake, and this time I have to present something. Come on, be a yes. bit cheerier. This is this is YouTube. You know, people don't I'm, watch I'm anything for more really... than five minutes unless you're like, oh my god, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to JavaScript. This is gonna be incredible. You know, you're gonna learn so much in this episode. You're gonna come away with your brain to be like three times the size it was. It's just, it's this is going to be the best part of your day, if not isn't, your isn't whole Isn't that how year. you die? If your brain grows to three times original size, I think I think you die. I think this, the idea is the skull would have to uh, also inflate. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you look like brain from Pinky and the Brain. Yes. Not, should we now we need to put a disclaimer on the show? Might make your skull grow <laughs> if you watch too much of this. It's like that's the new tagline for the the show. HTTP two or free might break your skull. <laughs> Great. So I I found a, a new JavaScript thing that intrigued me, uh, mostly in my role as the the maintainer of Comlink, ah. uh, where you know values in workers and main thread. They pretend to be in both places, but they're actually not. And then you know you get into garbage collection issues because things that you share will never get garbage collected because you know they're being shared. There's being references being held, and so I have learned more about this new proposal that is now shipped to Chrome Stable, which is weak refs. And I thought, you know what? Let's make a little episode about all this weak stuff. That JavaScript has anyway. Oh, so we're, and, not just, we're not just covering weak references. This is going to be the well. We have a short intro bit about what's been there so far and why it is the way it is because there are some weird, rough edges. Well, stop for teasing the me and just give me the information. Let's, let's let's do it, shall we? Okay. So I thought we start with what actually is a weak reference because it's been thrown around a lot and just want to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about. Really, what it means is whenever you have an object and you save, quote unquote, save that object in a variable, that variable is a strong reference to that object. And as long as there's any variable in your code that you know, has this object, this object will not get garbage collected, because that would be bad if the stuff you have in variables suddenly disappeared. Now, a weak reference is the kind of reference that doesn't prevent garbage collection. So if there was a way to have a variable being a weak reference to an object. If there is no references to an object or only weak references, basically no strong references, that object is free to get garbage collected at any point in time, and you might see your value actually disappear. Oh, OK, so so weak reference is kind of like, like if, if your weak reference is actually pointing to the object, then that's your way of, you, you kind of know, uh, there's probably something else that's using this right now. Maybe. You basically know that it has not been garbage collected yet. That's pretty much as much as you can deduce from that. Um, and there's already one little difference that you mentioned there, because just because you give up all strong references to an object doesn't necessarily imply that it will be immediately garbage collected. So a weak reference could theoretically still give you an object, even though there is no strong references to it anymore. And that's a detail that we're going to get more into a little bit later, because that's, it, it's an important distinction to make. It was, um, I, I heard that. I, um, I'm glad you're doing this talk, because I did read the article on weak references, and I came away still being quite confused. Um, <laughs> and it was some of the uncertainty that was a bit like, oh, I don't know, this uncertainty sounds bad. Um, it, so we're going to have a lot of that, because basically, we have had weak Two, two weak data types in JavaScript for actually quite a while. And those are the weak map and the weak set. And some might be surprised that these are fairly old. They were in IE 11. So they've been around for a long time. Yes. And what these two do is basically, in the weak map, the key is weak, meaning you can only get to the value when you have the key. 
but the key itself is not prevented from being garbage collected just by the fact that it's being used in the map. So if you know if you use a DOM node as the key in the weak map um, and don't save this DOM node anywhere else, if it gets garbage collected, your key and your value can disappear from that map. And that can be incredibly helpful. I often get see questions on Twitter, sometimes directed at me, sometimes at others, what the use cases for weak map and weak set are. And so one of the primary use cases for me is that for the longest time in JavaScript, uh, expandos, as they're called, have been fairly common. You just take an object and you throw new properties on it. Like you put just an underscore my stuff and put your stuff in there. And you know that's JavaScript. It works. But one of the downsides is that it's bad etiquette, basically, to, to transform objects that you don't own, also because that can cause the JavaScript runtime to de-optimize, because you're changing the shape, as it's called, of an object. And so generated binary code might not work anymore, and they would have to regenerate it. And so mutating objects you don't own is often a bad practice. And there's an ownership issue here as well, isn't there? Because now anything else that gets that profile node can see that internal data. Uh, yeah, because it's not really private. And you can never be 100% sure that you're not creating a name clash. Maybe in this case, you know, some library code actually does use underscore internal. Who knows? And so what you should be doing instead is you create a weak map. So in this case, we're getting something from the DOM. And instead of putting something on the DOM node itself, we use the DOM node as a key in our weak map and put our extra data into the value of the weak map. And that means as long as the DOM node exists, the value will continue to exist. But when the DOM node gets garbage collected, so will the value. And that's really useful. And for a weak set, it's basically for the use case. Whenever you find yourself doing a weak map where you store true in the value, that's like my prime example, where you just want to remember, have you visited a certain object? Have you already seen it? Have it has it already been processed? Those kind of things. That's where a weak set comes in. Um, however, and that is something that trips some people up or raises question marks, at least, is that neither of these are iterable. You cannot iterate over the keys in the weak map. You cannot iterate over the entries in a weak set. Weak stuff in general was never iterable. And that kind of comes from the fact that one of the fundamental principles, I think, by the W3C was you should never expose garbage collection. And the reason for it is actually from security. Because exposing garbage collection is what is what I learned when I researched this, is called a covert channel. Because now two pieces of JavaScript can communicate without ever knowing really of each other's existence. You can think about it a little bit that if you bundle two libraries um, and you pass you know, just an object from one library to another, now the one library might be able to track when the other library stops using that. And that could actually, if those two libraries do it in coordination, you can communicate a lot through that without ever accessing each other's data. Um, and that's, I mean, we, if you think about cookies, that's how tracking happens. And I think something like this could be exploited the same way. And so they never wanted to open this can of worms, basically. However, over time, there were more and more demands and use cases for actual weak references and exposing garbage collection. And so over time, they spent a lot of design work and collaboration between the engine authors to figure out how they can make this happen without making this covert channel an actual problem. And so the weak rest proposal was born. Before we move on to that, like one of the like this model with weak sets and weak references where you can't iterate on the keys, that in some ways it almost makes more sense to me. Because like it's that idea of like you, you can only open the door with a key, right? And, and, and if you lose the key, you can no longer open the door. Um, the, the equivalence here with like, because we don't just have weak map and weak set, there's also map and set, which can iterate. And that seems like a kind of model where I've lost my keys. Ugh, I better go and ask the door for them back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> which fair it would be problematic um, in general, wouldn't it? So <laughs> that, yeah, let's, let's not let real doors be inspired <laughs> by computer science maps. That, no, I don't think that's a good idea. So yeah, so this is where we now can talk about weak ref. This is marked as advanced because it can be fairly hard to reason about the second garbage collection is involved. It becomes undeterministic, unpredictable, um, but also because whenever you use it, think really, really hard 
if there isn't a way you can solve the problem without it, because this will be likely to introduce more bugs than it fixes, because it <laughs> is a fairly hand wavy spec almost. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, well, well, when garbage selection like, happens, isn't spec at all. Isn't I, spec. And that's one of the, uh, the underlying problems for this entire thing. In fact, um, someone even said to me, like, like well, the, the JavaScript engines are not required to garbage collect. Like, if the spec doesn't we'll get say to they that. must. We'll get to that, because that is oh, actually okay. something. Basically, we have regrefs now. And in the end, they do violate the principle of exposing garbage collection. They do create that covert channel. But they did spend a lot of time in the design to make sure that, on the one hand, engines are still able to optimize and you know, iterate on their internal architecture freely without being constrained by this weak ref existing, and also to limit the bandwidth of this covert channel to such an extent that the risks are extremely low to that actually being a real problem. What are these actual problems? Why is this actually such an quote unquote advanced topic? Well, the first problem is that garbage collection is non-obvious or non-deterministic. For example, if two values become unreachable at the same time, like you give up your strong references at the same time, that does not mean they will get garbage collected at the same time. Or, and that is also something that you might not know, like um, it might look like you made something unreachable, but it is in fact not because the way that internal data structures work or they, like on native data structures to JavaScript, or closures, there might still be a reference you're just not aware of. And so your reasoning might just be flawed and really hard to figure out where it is going wrong. Engines will garbage collect differently from each other. So something that might work in one browser, or when, when something gets garbage collected in one browser, it might not in another. It actually might get garbage collected in one previous release of your browser, but not in the current one. Or it might get actually garbage collected in the first run but not in the second run of the same code on the same website, because there's so many factors that the engine incorporates when to run garbage collection that it is inherently unpredictable. And this is what I brought up earlier. Garbage collection and something being unreachable are inherently separate things. Something being unreachable is a requirement for getting garbage collected, but they basically can be an arbitrary and infinitely long time in between. Most browsers run their garbage collector when they feel like the browser has downtime and only when it's under memory pressure. So you know, if you're running on a super beefy machine, garbage collection might just not happen as a trade-off for keeping the page re responsive, snappy, and fast. Um, and so that's just something to really keep in mind also for the rest of the discussion that when we talk about garbage collection, we, need, we mean the moment in time when a value is being deleted from memory and the memory is being freed up not the point where it's becoming unreachable for your code. Yeah, it's, a, it's an optimization pass. Like, garbage collection is optimization. It, it was weird when I heard that, yeah, it, browsers aren't required to garbage collect, or JavaScript engines aren't required to garbage collect, because it's like, but all the code everywhere would break if they didn't garbage collect. And it's like, well, yeah, but <laughs> never mind. It is something they all do. It's just when, uh, when they do it and how they do it is completely unspecified. Yeah, and just to give it a separate point, it GC will happen late or sometimes not at all. That can happen. And actually, there is um, a lot of details to this that this well, I will talk about a bit later. All right, let's look about at the actual weak ref API. It is a very, very tiny, slim API, which is nice. So you create a value. That value has to be an object, because only object gets garbage collected. Things like numbers, strings, the primitives don't get garbage collected. And you just put it in a weak ref. And now you have a weak ref to the value. Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. I'm confused. No, 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 no. I, OK, strings do get garbage collected, right? If I create a 100 megabyte string and then lose my reference to it, it will be garbage collected. I think the, the, I think the difference is that you can recreate that exact string later. Whereas you can't, well, once you lose access to an object, you can't recreate that exact object again. It would be a different instance of that object. I'm not 100% sure on strings now that you say that. I think strings are special in that they're not objects and that two strings you create separately will be considered identical. And I think strings are shared in a, in like a string pool because of this identity, uh, reference identity that they have. Um, so I, so I, may, I think they will probably be removed from that pool, especially large strings. But I think that's what considered garbage collection. I'm not sure on this one. So we'll probably add something in the notes 
of this video. I'm pretty sure you cannot create a weak ref to a string. Yeah, it's probably similar to how it can't be the key to a weak map or a weak yeah. set um, because you can recreate them again. So it's the same goes for like numbers and symbols and like yeah. null, null and undefined, that kind of thing. So this is now a weak ref. The weak ref is a weak reference to the value that I create above. Um, even if we didn't put the value in its own variable, which is a strong reference, like if we didn't have a single strong reference, we would be guaranteed that this value would continue to exist until the next task. So that way, we can make sure it doesn't get garbage created immediately. We might, you know, we might have a promised chain where we want to process, use this value in the next micro task. That much is guaranteed. And this is not only you know, for code to work as you expect, but also one of these mitigations for the bandwidth in that the, the lifetime of the value is elongated so that you can't communicate it as much through garbage collection just because now it's delayed until the next, next task. And now we could basically call .deref on the weak reference to see if the value is still there at some point later. And then this maybe value will be undefined if the value had been GC'd at some point between these calls, or it will be the actual value if it hasn't. And if we call deref and get the value, again, that's a new point in time where we say, OK, now the value will continue to exist until the next task at the very least. Again, for this guarantee and to limit the amount of communication that you can do. So when you've called deref, like, all right, two questions. Can you call deref multiple times? Yes, as many times as you like. And so, and that, and then the thing you've got is now a strong reference. Deref gives you a strong reference. Yes, it gives. Yeah. yeah, basically. And so once until that variable ceases to exist, but even then the value will not be garbage collected at the very least until the next task. This is actually one of the consistency guarantees. So you can have multiple weak refs to the same value. And D, calling deref on all of them will always yield the same result. There's no way that one weak ref will still have it and the other one won't. Those will always be consistent. So with this, we can have weak reference and hold onto a value without preventing it from being garbage collected. But actually, sometimes it's more helpful to have it the other way around, where we get informed uh, when something has been garbage collected. Because this way, we don't. We just have to check. I guess, every frame or something. like It's really hard to, you would have to do polling, and that's bad. You want to have the inversion where you get notified when something gets garbage collected. And that's the other part, the other half of this proposal. And that is called the finalization registry. The finalization registry takes a callback that will be called whenever a value that you have registered with a registry gets garbage collected. And you basically register that value with a held value. And now this is something um, that might be confusing to some people at first, because the value that you wait to that will be called whenever it's not the value that gets passed into the callback. And that's simply because at the time the callback is called, the value has already been garbage collected. Doing it the other way around, where you pass the value in just before it gets garbage collected, could allow you to store a new strong reference. Then the garbage collector would have to undo its thing. And it would be way more complicated. So what you do instead, you get a separate value that you can pass in, and that can be something of, for your internal bookkeeping to know which value it originally was, or maybe it's the underlying resource you want to free up, whatever. Can you pass the same object in twice? No, that's not going to work, because it has to have a strong reference then. Oh, okay. the, yeah, so the, set, the <laughs> held value is called held value because it is strongly held. So yes. if you, you, I mean, you could call register some value some value, but that would prevent garbage collection from ever happening on some yes. value. So this is, this is your optimization step. So if you've got like, if you've vended an object and you've, you've got some sort of system where I want to keep this WebSocket open while this object is still being used, this is the pattern you would use. Because you get that call back and you go, oh, that object's gone now. Now I can do my related optimizations like close the WebSocket. Yeah. And, and it is also important to note that you know the, the callback will be called at the same time the value gets garbage collected or at some point later in time. So And again, this is up for interpretation by the engine. It can be very, very long between the actual garbage collection and when this callback will actually be invoked. But what about the weak ref, then? Is there, is there guarantees there? Like, it, like, Could there be a situation where if I deref a weak reference, it returns like undefined or whatever, but this callback fires like an hour later or something? Yes, I think that is a possibility. So I think if the callback has been called, deref will definitely return undefined. 
DRF returning undefined doesn't require that this callback has been called because it isn't required to get called at all. And this is what I want to talk about DEX, because there is no guarantee the callback will run. And that's why it's so important that this callback isn't used for critical work. This callback should be used if a value being garbage collected means you can free up even more memory internally. It is supposed to allow you to reduce memory pressure further. It is not supposed to be used to actually do um, business logic cleanup work. Uh, because it might not ever get called. And so in that case, you might actually be more wasteful with these resources than necessary. Yeah, you couldn't build like an analytic system that tells you how many objects are around using this because you, it doesn't come with those guarantees. Yes. So that's one of the reasons, for example, why this has been tailored with WebAssembly in mind, because WebAssembly often passes values to JavaScript that represent something is actually in WebAssembly memory. Um, and so in that case, it makes sense, because if the representation in JavaScript gets garbage collected, meaning the engine thinks it's under memory pressure, then code can run to free up even more memory in WebAssembly lands. But if that memory doesn't get freed, it doesn't inhibit the functionality of the app or wastes user resources to an unnecessary extent. So yeah, as I said, there is no guarantee that this will run. And there's some two things that they point out makes it especially unlikely for them to run. One is if you close the tab or if you kill the process, there is no need for the engine or no requirement for the engine to run all the registered callbacks if you just kill the process. So it shouldn't be used to like do cleanup work when somebody leaves the page. And it's also very unlikely for these callbacks to run if the registry itself becomes unreachable by your code. Um, so I guess if the registry gets garbage collected unreachable, um, there is no guarantee that these callbacks will ever be called in the future. Now that we've registered something to get cleaned up, sometimes we might discover later on, actually, we don't want this callback handler to run ever. We want to unregister a certain value. For that to work, the function register takes a third parameter, which is the unregister token. It's similar to the held value in that it symbolizes uh, what you need to have to unregister this one value. In this case, however, unregistered token could be the same thing as some value because it is not strongly held. But sometimes it might be easier for you to use a different value altogether just for bookkeeping purposes or keeping it simple or something like that. And then you can just call it unregister with this unregistered token, and that will prevent remove your value from the registry. And now one last method on the finalization registry, which actually I found really interesting because it's the first time that I have seen a normative optional API. That means this API is in the spec, is spec'd out, but implementers are not required to implement it. I think mm -hmm. the only other API on the web that has a similar fate currently are shared array buffers in that they are spec'd, they're agreed upon, they're merged and everything, uh, but they're not required to be implemented to be fully spec compliance. Is this the same reason? Is it, is it a security timing thing? Yes, I mean shared array. We all know the the you know, or we have probably heard of the the history with shared array buffer that was removed because of spec and meltdown, and now it's slowly being incorporated. But they still leave it up to the engine to decide whether they want to enable them. If they don't, basically, browsers who hadn't shipped any mitigation or found a good mitigation shouldn't be considered spec in compliance, uncompliance, in compliance, uh, in in compliant. I think it is. <laughs> Whatever it is. Don't, don't, don't say that about the browser that doesn't have shared array buffer because it's a very yeah. tough problem. That's basically the thinking behind it. And this apparently had a long discussion behind it, which I'm not going to try to summarize. But some browsers didn't want to ship this. Other browsers did want to ship this. There was basically a big contention around, should this ever be, because it's a synchronous API that runs callbacks on amount of values that might have been garbage collected. Oh, sorry, I should explain what this function does first. So the function is called cleanup sum. And that is basically you saying, hey, if you have a chance, call all the callbacks for the values that have been garbage collected, but you haven't called the callback on just yet. Um, so you're kind of opting like, hey, I, I would like to process these things now. Um, I actually kind of surprised they made it optional because it would just ju be just a spec compliant to make it a no op because you don't have to run the callbacks. You can just say like, nah, not running anything. It's just a little, it's a little poke, isn't it? It's just like, please, please, please. But there were browser vendors disagreeing on whether this is good for the main thread or not. And so in the end, they just made it normative optional to implement this. And it currently looks like, that at least on the web, uh, we will only be shipping it in workers, not on the main thread, uh, which I thought is 
quite interesting. So you do have to check whether this method exists before calling it. And this is where optional chaining comes in super handy. We just do like a little question mark dot parentheses, and then it will be called only if that function actually exists. And that's not the first thing that that's happened with, with in JavaScript, right? Because we've got um, it's the atomic stuff, right? There's, there's methods on atomics that are only in the workers as well. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, just keep in mind, you need to check before it's there. And again, this method is just a request to run these callbacks. There's no requirement from the browser to actually process, call any callbacks or process any values. Um, that's what I mean. Like This entire API is very much trying to leave this freedom for the engine implementers to allow them to implement better garbage collection algorithms in the future um, so that they're not constrained by weak refs and finalization registry. Um, and so it is very, it, it is a, you need to be very careful when working with this. One thing I want to close with that with this, you can now actually build an iterable weak map. And interestingly enough, there's an entire implementation of this in the explainer that is, I have a link here, bit.ly slash iterable weak map. If you want to look at that, I'm not going to go through it here because there are other things to track to make sure that everything is garbage correctly and so on and so forth. But if you're curious, uh, take a look. The weak refs implementation has shipped in current stable Chrome. I have actually merged it into Comlink. So if your browser supports weak refs, I will automatically garbage collect stuff across the worker boundary now, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, build, try, try it out, play around with it, but remain careful to. Do we have enough time for you to quickly describe how you used it in Comlink? Comlink, what it does is you have a val value in a worker. And you basically create a proxy on a main thread saying, like, you, proxy, behave like that object in the worker. And then under the hood, I use a, a message passing protocol to say, this person wants to access property A. Send me the value of property A, please. And then this round trip happens. Um, what I'm doing now is basically have a simple reference counting algorithm. Whenever a proxy is created, I increment that counter. And previously, I had a, an explicit release function. I still have that, an explicit release function. Like, I don't need this proxy anymore. That decreases the counter. And when the counter reaches 0, that thing can get garbage collected um, on the worker side, that is. Um, now, you basically implicitly call that function when the proxy gets garbage collected. And you can opt in of that. You can nice. opt out of that. But this, again, like this is if, if there is memory pressure, it might be useful for the engine that I release unused objects in the worker side as well. And so I pretty much just use a weak ref, uh, a finalization registry, sorry, to no get a notification this proxy has been released. And then I can decrease the counter on the worker side and just let go of the message channels once that counter reaches 0. I should say, like this is super advanced stuff. And anyone watching this shouldn't be like, Oh, my code doesn't use weak references. I should go and add them in somehow. Like, don't do that. Please don't. Yeah, <laughs> don't. Please don't. But it, it is just enabling these like couple of edge cases where you can make extra optimizations, or or like you say, you you can avoid a case where you have to call an explicit um, destructor, like release function or something like that. Yeah, and it, it, yeah. For me, obviously, it is the most exciting part is the WebAssembly bit where you now get a deeper integration between the garbage collector and JavaScript and your memory in WebAssembly. So this is the first stepping stone towards getting garbage collected languages to WebAssembly without having to ship your own garbage collector code in WebAssembly. So that's gotcha. it's not the whole story, but it's the first puzzle piece. And so I'm obviously thinking ahead and quite excited about the prospect of having uh, managed languages be smaller and, I guess, better in WebAssembly. Cool. Well, we'll link to uh, the V8 article and, uh, and to yes. Comlink. We'll, we'll show where you're using it in <laughs> Why Comlink. Not? Um, yeah, that's good. Actually, I do now understand it a lot better <laughs> than I did before. I'm glad. <laughs> so well, well, well done, Sarma. Well done, me. It's super advanced, this stuff. And like yeah. anyone watching this, sh and anyone watching this shouldn't, shouldn't oh, Christ, Jesus, what's I'm out of practice. We should say, though, that this is super advanced stuff.